Thank you, Wing. Um, yeah, so the, the last week you heard from, from Joe Dunkley on, uh, on the, uh, the cosmic microwave background where we have these beautiful images of the universe that are mostly s telling us about the universe when it was a few hundred thousand years old. Um, and, and there we were able to measure the temperature of the radiation to, to enor uh, fantastic precision and, and al almost to the cosmic variance limit, map out fluctuations in, in the temperature of, of the universe at the surface blast scattering. So I'm going to talk about the next time where we're able to, to say something about the temperature of, of the universe uh, um, several hundred million years, actually a couple billion years uh, later, uh, after the universe is reionized. And so we think uh, um, somewhere between when the universe was a couple hundred million years and, and a billion years old, the stars in the first galaxies produced photons that, that ionized the gas. Um, and they ionized it sufficiently that, that between uh, redshift uh, six and, 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 and uh, to, to redshift zero, we can, we can observe this gas uh, with the Lyman alpha forest and, and have been able to use the Lyman alpha forest to measure the, the, t the temperature of the intergalactic medium. And so since this is Princeton, I thought I'd start this talk with a, a brief history of, of uh, Lyman Alpha Forest research because a lot of the major players who ha um, um, uh, drove this field over the last 50-something um, years um, uh, were at, at either are at Princeton or w were at Princeton at one point. And so the, the, the research in this field started somewhere around 1965, I guess similar to when we first detected the CMB. Um, the, and the, uh, with Martin Schmidt detecting several quasars at with very, very extreme redshifts, and one of those quasars had a redshift greater than two, which means that the, the Lyman alpha line redshifts into the optical, and so you can observe it from, from ground-based observatories. And so this was immediately pointed out that there, if, there's, if, if there's gas in the intergalactic medium, it should absorb the, the radiation from that quasar um, and in fact, if you take just modern values for cosmological parameters, then the, uh, unless the universe is highly ionized, then, the, 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 then, then you should see complete absorption from the intergalactic medium. Um, and so this, uh, soon after this prediction, the, uh, uh, Roger Lenz uh, found an extremely high redshift quasar, almost redshift three, uh, where the, there was evidence for this Lyman, uh, uh, Lyman absorption from hydrogen. Um, however, they, he didn't see this, these, these Gunn-Peterson troughs, and so the implication was that the IGM must be highly ionized, and eventually the, the, the community coalesced on, this, on that the, the ionization mechanism must be photoionization, the collisional ionization just re required too much fine tuning. Uh, and then jump forward to the 1990s uh, the, uh, with Keck and the high-res spectrograph, we started getting these extremely beautiful resolved spectra, signal noise 100 in every pixel of the Lyman Alpha Forest. And then, then in the mid-90s, the, the first cold dark matter hydro simulations were run. Um, uh, the, the first simulations were here at Princeton, Yun Yu Sin and Gary Ostreicher, Jordan Moralda SG Day, who was here at the time. Um, uh, and, and one of the, the first applications of these simulations was, was the, to, to see how well they did at, at reproducing the Lyman Alpha Forest. And, and, it t uh, and what they found immediately is that they, the simulations produced something that looked strikingly like the observation. Um, and many people point to this as one of the great successes of the window for cosmology. Okay. And so the, and the, I think that that result, that the simulations look a lot like the observations, sparked a lot of research around the year 2000. And if I had, if I were to characterize this this field, I would say that the, uh, th then a after that um, a spat of a lot of research, um, then there there there, were, there was um, uh, um, n not a whole lot, a huge amount of work, uh, but in the last five years or so, or so people have have started to come back to the, the, the st studying the Lyman Alpha Forest. Um, for me, one reason is that the, uh, many of the observers kept these really high quality spectra under lock and key, 
and the and it's now it's the many of them are available to me as your to 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 read you um and and so the and and so you can you you can you can look at whatever uh for these really beautiful spectra of whatever statistic you're interested in and so a lot of people are doing this but if a hundred quasars isn't enough then there's uh, there's almost two hundred thousand quasars with uh observed with SDSS ba um not quite as high quality as the Keck spectra um and then uh the also people have started to get statistical samples at higher redshift this is something that I'll touch upon at at uh later on in this talk um and then for the Lyman alpha force it was it's always been really difficult to simulate the the, the in the s in the sense that to the you have to resolve fairly small scales but I you want to make statistical statements about what's going on in the universe and the range of scales that you need the dynamic range is is pretty hard to achieve uh, but it, i think it we're now at the point where our simulations are big enough here's here's a picture of a of one really large simulation that's been run um where where we uh, th this is no longer as much a, a, such a problem um and then just to segue into what i'm talking about the now we're in the post planck era where we've constrained at least in the standard cosmology our cosmological parameters extremely well i think one of the more interesting quantities is the the temperature of the gas in the galactic in the intergalactic medium and and i'll i'll explain why that's wh i think that's the case okay so the outline of this talk is I'm going to tell you about some I, I models for the IGM temperature and I can I don't like to use the word models because in astrophysics it always feels like if if it's a model you can just tune it and reproduce whatever you want and for the temperature of the IGM as I'm going to explain there's not a whole lot of freedom at least in our standard model for how how this works after the uh, after things are ionized um and so I'm going to take models and i'm going to try to interpret some recent temperature measurements spanning redshift 1 and 1/2 to to almost redshift 5 that i'm going to talk about the uh like gun peterson troughs in the lyman alpha forest uh th these these troughs were first discovered um here uh, at, at princeton by Xiao Wei Fan and Michael Strauss and um the um the they were at much higher redshift than the the in the 1970s the quasars we were looking at and so the it, it took the Sloan quasars to be able to the high redshift quasars to be able to find them. And so the, there's been a lot of work and I, and I think there's some interesting implications from this work um on trying to understand what these Gun Peterson troughs are telling us in 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 the last few years. Um and then uh, I'm also going to talk about how the temperature of the IGM affects both galaxies. I feel like in in a talk you always want to hit on galaxy formation because uh, like half of a astronomy is people are looking on galaxies although this I think this is not as much the case in in uh at at the IAS um and then uh I okay I might not get to the the last bullet point I just wanted to get Scott excited <laughs> Okay so uh, um it's a, in so in the standard story for the for the temperature that IGM after reionization the what well the principles that shape the 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 thermal history are are pretty simple and so I'm going to go through these these different principles and so here's an early model for for how we we might expect the temperature to evolve and and I'm going to show you more sophisticated models Okay so the first principle and this is a principle that I feel like no one pays any attention to but uh, the so so the, the so you have these ionization fronts that are moving out around the first galaxy so um the so they're sweeping across the inter intergalactic medium um and the uh, uh and they're very narrow so the most most regions are either very neutral or very ionized and so the, the and the at at the location of these ionization fronts which are just kpc across the uh the the you have a lot of electrons and a lot of neutrals and so the electrons hit the neutrals and make it so that collisional cooling is extremely efficient And so the um and so then then the it, it turns out that the temperature that you heat up that intergalactic medium to is very is pretty insensitive to the spectrum of the sources and depends mostly on how quickly these ionization fronts are moving across the universe. Um and the and collisional cooling is exponentially sensitive to temperature. And so you can make arguments based on the size of the structures and the duration of the ionization that we expect that 
that the it's pretty it's a pretty r narrow range of temperatures that you would expect these ionization starts to heat things up to something like twenty twenty five thousand Kelvin. Um, and so so you heat up you ionize regions to twenty to tw twenty five thousand Kelvin. Um, oh, uh, th this is because in in the IGM a lot of a lot of the time proper megaparsec is 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 used for the this is to this is to in indicate co-moving. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so the sec second principle is so you've you've heated things up to twenty thousand Kelvin, and then the then the then the IGM wants to cool, the and the at high redshifts the way it cools is uh, is uh, um, by by um, Compton scattering the CNG. Um, and the uh, because the, CM, the energy density of the CMG is you know much higher at high redshifts, and then at lower redshifts the principal way that it cools is is by uh, adiabatic expansion of the universe. Um, the however, and this is just like a weird thing in in astrophysics in general, like like it, it the where Occam's razor just never seems to hold. Like in that the like every every other cooling that you kind of could think might be important is important at a at I would say at a not a negligible level. Um, and then okay, so you 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 heat it up, the gas is cooling, and then the the next principle is that the um the like not only is it cooling, but the gas in the universe is recombining. Um, and when it recombines it's being um the, it, uh so if I have a, a a hydrogen atom it recombines it roughly we we know this from studying Lyman Alpha Forest. Roughly thirty thousand years l later, like it will be ionized again. So over a very short time scale, it will, will um, uh, be be reionized, and this will inject heat into the intergalactic medium. Um, and so the and so the amount of heating after the gas is ionized is principally set by the recombination of the gas, and it depends pretty weakly on the spectrum of the sources because uh, the because the, the the most of these the photons that are absorbed are near the photoionization potential of the of, of the species we're talking about. Um, okay, and if you look at the coefficients, these are the units are kind of weird. But all of, like all of the coef the, the you're you're heating things up maybe forty thousand four thousand Kelvin per giga year, and then the coolants are kind of the same. So all all of these are important. Okay, and so then the next principle, the uh, if I can call it a principle, is that the in, at least in our standard story the. We think stars ionize the hydrogen and helium, and one electron of the helium, but they, it's hard for stars to produce photons that, that can doubly ionize helium. And so, our, uh, in our standard story, we think that the helium is doubly ionized later by by quasars, which have a much harder spectrum. Okay, but uh, so those are the principles. The and the, but we could be missing something, and there have been a lot of papers claiming that we are missing something. So you just need to put in a pretty pathetic amount of energy in the intergalactic medium to to change the thermal history that you would expect from this generic, the generic history um, by order one, like you just need about an EV per giga year. And so there have been a ton of papers on blazars being able to do this to a mechanism that's kind of neat. Um, cosmic rays, galactic feedback, dust absorption, and, 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 and maybe more exotic things. Yeah, the photo photoelectric absorption where it, so it just, you have a, Photons that are absorbed by the dust, and then it, you know, gives it heat to everything else. So, I am not the so, yeah. Okay. All right. So, so how does the so the g getting back to the standard scenario? How how does the, uh, um, the how how does how does so just just to give you a picture for kind of how 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 things depend on different parameters. So this is redshift of the universe. And so let's, let's say I ionize the universe at redshift nine, and then I just say the I use different spectral index indices for the slope of the ionizing background that's keeping things ionized. Th this background tends to be harder than the background of of, of, of sources because it's it's um, filtered by Lyman limit systems. Um, and so if I choose humongously different slopes, then then my temperature don't don't vary that much. Say say again. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's the, the or the it doesn't the amplitude doesn't matter because it's set by uh, the uh, of the heating because it's it's set by how quickly you're recombining. So every time you recombine, you put in energy, and so it depends on the um, on alpha. It doesn't depend on the the the, the level of the spectrum. Um, okay, the so then if I if I vary the redshift that the gas is ionized, let's and this the, these these are just toy models. So let's say that all of the gas in the universe is ionized instantaneously, that's which is ridiculous at a, at a, at a certain redshift. Then, then if I did this redshift six, eight, nine, and then it it really doesn't depend much on redshift. If I did higher redshift, then 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 I would I would get these curves, and then the the bottom panel is 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 is, is also uh, is is heating up the gas to different temperatures, which I would argue is not not even it, because of the first principle I, I mentioned, not not likely. Okay, and so the. There's there's kind of a neat result, like a famous result in IGM research. The and I, I, maybe I shouldn't even say it's IGM research because this applies to most of the gas in the universe. But, um, the the that uh, the that so if you take your you run a simulation of the universe and you just plop down a bunch of particles in that simulation. So uh, the black points are just 300 particles ra randomly selected from the simulation. Then they lie on a, a near parallel relation, especially the higher the redshift, the closer it is to parallel. The, and at lower redshift, you have some shock heating that causes deviation from this relation. The, the red points are, are, are doing a calculation that doesn't allow for shock, shock heating. So if there were no shock heating in the universe, things would fall on an almost perfect parallel. Um, so what I was showing you before is the temperature at the mean density. I should have said this is the temperature at the mean density. But, and, but you can, the, the, the theory for the temperature at every density is pretty simple. And, and actually, the, the reason why you, uh, most of the gas in the universe falls on this simple, power, like single parallel is, is kind of neat. It's a kind of a coincidence of the, for, for um, the, the, the temperature dependence of the equilibrium photoheating rate is such that you're always heating the gas up to, um, uh, at, so, so it's, not like that it, it's not that the gas is cooling adiabatically, even though this, it, the, the index of this parallel is close to what you would say is, 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 is close to adiabatic. But it's, it's that you're, you're, because you're, often, you're always photoheating the gas. And so you're, all of the gas particles are ascending to a higher adiabat. Um, but the, the, you're doing this in such a way that they all are going to the same independent of density, adiabat, almost adiabat. And so then this ma makes it so that even though structure formation is very, di in different regions of the universe to reach a given density is, is quite different. The, the as because you're always ascending to the same uh, adiabat, you, there's almost no dependence on, on how the structure forms on, on, its, on, its, on its temperature at a given time. Um, and so I, so some of this insight was actually not in the literature. It's, a, it's just kind of a cute paper that we wrote about this uh, recently. Okay. Okay, so uh, application one. Um, the uh, so I'm going to first talk about modeling some recent temperature measurements of of the of the redshift two to four intergalactic medium, um, with and the the person who led this is uh, Phoebe Upton Sanderbeck, who's a, a grad student at University of Washington, who many of you have met because she was visiting. Okay. So first, I, I've, I've told you a lot about temperature, but I haven't told you how you measure temperature from the Lyman Alpha Forest. And so the principle for how you measure temperature is pretty simple. Which so, so here is a skewer of, through a simulation, a mock Lyman Alpha Forest skewer. And I'm going to run this movie, and it's going to vary the temperature at the mean density of the universe. Um, or, uh, and, and you're going to see that the lines get broader um, it, as the temperature increases. And, so th and that, that's principally the effect. It's just principally thermal broadening of the lines in the Lyman Alpha Forest. And th this is the power spectrum. A lot of the methods for measuring the temperature are, are, are looking at the power, the power at a certain range of scales. OK. So the, I would say as of 2010, so 2010, we, uh, we, Adam Litz let, let us study that um, both Matthias and I were involved with to measure te the temperature. And so, th uh, and this this was the f f first measurement in a while. So, so most of the measurements of the temperature of the IGM were around the year 2000. Matthias was involved with one of them. Um, most of these, be because high resolution spectra were uh, were not super available, most of these used maybe a, a handful, like ten or order ten quasars. Um, and so we did, we tried to measure things, and and I, I would say 
uh, the, or, or I, I, but, and I would say, like, if you just look at this plot, like, it's kind of a total mess. Like, the, like, the, and this, it's mostly because the error, error bars are quite large. I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would say they, they're inconsistent with each other. There are definitely points that are inconsistent. But the, as of 2010, we, we weren't really successful at measuring the temperature, which is um, just not quite doing as well as the CMD. Yeah, th these are, uh, it's, uh, um, the, the black I can tell you are all, all VLT and most of the others are using text. Uh, the, so the way you constrain velocity dispersions that are turbulent, or, or uh, even, uh, I wouldn't even say this, or, or even like a lot of the velocity is from the Hubble flow, or just the fa peculiar velocities, um, is to use these simulations that um, the, that we, so the Lyman alpha force is probing relatively low density gas in the universe, it's around the mean density, depending on what redshift you're talking about. Um, and so there, the, we, we believe that our simulations are doing a really good job, and the, statist the statistics kind of show that this is the case. So, and this is why people think that they can, they can constrain cosmology from the Lyman alpha force, because it's kind of this primordial, like there, there's some background that's ionizing things, but it's mostly just tracing the dens density fluctuations in the universe that the simulations are capturing. Yeah, that's right. So the e e at each redshift, they're they're using a bunch of spectra to to accept, or uh, the blue are using half of the spectra, but the the but they're using um, some fraction of uh, 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 so each sight line is giving you some range in redshift, and then you're using a p several several sight lines. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But it's going to be less of a mess in a second. So, <laughs> okay. And so then the I, I wasn't involved with this, but this is it's kind of been nice to follow. Is that the the, the uh, um, George Becker uh, did a measurement in 2011. Um, George has access to much better data than almost all of us. And and then, um, and then there were a bunch of follow-ups that claimed to find consistent temperature. Um, and the, the, so one thing that George did is rather than measuring the temperature than mean density, and he's not only the, he's not the first person to do this, but um, instead he, the Lyman alpha force, depending on what redshift you're looking at, you're really sensitive to like some mildly overdense to fairly so somewhat overdense um, the re region in the universe. And so he, so he said, I'm not even going to try to constrain the temperature to mean density, which was a lot of the source of the error in the previous plot. And I'm just going to constrain the temperature at, at the, 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 the density I'm most sensitive to. And I'm not really sensitive to, uh, to the, the, the slope of the temperature density relationship. So I'd, if I try to extrapolate back to the temperature at the mean density, then, then, um, I'm, uh, uh, then there's a lot of uncertainty depending on what slope I assume for, for to, to extrapolate, especially at low redshift. At high redshift, not so much. This is from so this is from studying simulations and and and, and figuring out if if I change oh the oh y the the, uh, the reason it's so smooth is just because you're looking you're seeing denser regions and less oh is that what you mean or oh yeah I, that's a good point I I don't know yeah I I, I that I can't promise on. <laughs> The why? Oh, why is this the temperature of the mean density of the universe? Yes. Yeah, that's right. So that's this is the slope of this temperature density relation that I mentioned before. Or this is yeah emphasizing how insensitive, or the how d it depends very much on what he. What he what he models the temperature density relation to be. Yeah, so th there's probably some systematic error budget as well. But the uh, I, I I see I, Jim I, I understand what you're saying, um, but but I will show you that like at least 
the in the context of how we think things happen, the these error bar the, these measurements seem to make some some sense. So which I, when I first saw these, I thought there was something wrong, but that for a different reason. But uh, that I won't go into. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, the so so what we're doing is the, the so the kind of the previous um, paper that did did a, something very similar to what we're doing is time in machine. So the measurements have gotten better, perhaps, um, and then I think also the principles are a little bit better understood. Um, and then the uh, for for how the temperature should evolve. Okay, so what are we what are we doing? So we're gonna so the reionization is really extended, um, and so and so the the simple models I showed you before are not are n are not what you should be doing, the like assuming that everything ionizes at a given redshift, and so we heat and cool the gas based on the simple rules given before, but because reionization is sim temporally extended, we follow the heating and cooling of multiple elements. So if reionization, so first I'm gonna start talking about hydrogen reionization, and I'm gonna fit helium in in a second. So if hydrogen reionization spans redshift six to 10, then I have a bunch of elements that are spanning that redshift history. Um, and then I'm gonna compare the mean temperature of my model um, to, the, the, to the measured temperature. The, because my model's gonna have a scatter in temperature. The, this is not obvious that this sh should be the right thing to do. And in fact, I would, my bias was that the, it should really be the lower temperatures that you're most sensitive to. But a lot of work has gone into the statement that the, the your measurement is most sensitive to the mean temperature and not, uh, and part of this reason, the reason is in, in all of our models, the scatter and the temperature tends not to be that large. And so if the scatter, less than one. Um, and so if the scatter isn't, uh, or, uh, or the, fluctu the fluctuation, the scatter and the fluctuation is, is, is tends to be much less than one uh, for the temperature. And so it, it, in that case, the any way of measuring the mean is gonna give you, or giving measuring an average is gonna give you kind of the same thing. Um, and then I, in a, if you look at our paper, we, we compare in this T delta space that George measures. The, but, but for the plots I'm, go, I'm going to make, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna extrapolate using kind of the middle model in all of, um, all, in, in all of my calculations um, to T naught. Beca because T naught is, is a bit more of an intuitive space. And I'm gonna make the claim and look at our paper uh, that it doesn't really matter which models we assume to extrapolate because the temperature density relationship tends to be pretty similar between all of the models that I showed you in every channel. Okay, at high redshifts, it really doesn't matter how you extrapolate, but okay, so then the, these are the measurements of the temperature, and then these are different, the reionization histories, they're linear in redshift, and so the, they just span different different durations. Um, uh, um, and and uh, uh, rough, the roughly what you should say is see is that the, 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 temp the measured temperature seems consistent with all, all of the models to um, the at least to, 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 to one signal oh so now I'm only looking at the highest redshift and then I'm gonna like at lower redshift you're really looking at helium reionization so I've, I haven't described to you how I'm gonna put in helium reionization helium yeah so that high these redshifts we don't expect helium is, is, is having an effect so if I assume that helium isn't being reionized then thing, the me measurements seem kind of consistent with what, what we would expect in, in, in any, any plausible model for reionization. That I don't want to explain, but it's making some corrections that, that uh, w we're a little unsure about. So look, look at the black. I wanted to have my student delete this. I just, the, 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 I, I didn't get to do that in time. Um, okay. Okay, so then uh, the, the, um, so, so, th so then most of the data is sensitive to, to times when we think the helium is being doubly ionized by quasars. And so then we put it, we, we came up with a simple model for this that really, I, I spent a lot of time at w one point modeling helium reionization, but uh, th I think this model captures the essence of what happens. And so, the, so you have these quasars and they blow these helium three bubbles in the, in the universe. Um, and so the lower energy photons are absorbed in these bubbles but it turns out that the mean tree path for helium-2 ionizing photons, especially if you're talking about a couple hundred EV, can be very, photons and greater, can be very large. And so you tend to have a lot of heating that's a more uniform background. And so we have a two-phase model where we have local heating and, and heating from stuff, from photons that are, that, that, um, 
that, that have long mean free paths, some of them are, the, the, the higher energy photons are just never absorbed. So you tend to absorb up to maybe 500 UV. Okay, and, the, and so then th this is the result. And the, the points are George's and, an, and another measurement of, of this more recent measurement of the temperature. That, um, and the, and I, I'm showing you, in this panel, I'm showing you um, varying the background spectral index that's keeping the hydrogen ionized, um, which turned out to be one of the parameters that had the biggest effect. And, and I'm using AGN observations so we, for that tell us how, um, how quasars, um, the w that, that predict what the emissivity of quasars should be. Like kind of, and a really neat thing of for helium ionization models is that if you just take the quasars that we um, that we've that um, we've observed and and ask what what redshift should they ionize the helium? This is something like uh, this turns out to be around redshift three, and then from studying the helium two Lyman alpha force, we also start to see Gunn Peterson costs in the helium two Lyman alpha force around redshift three, which I think I. I've argued is is pretty convincing that that helium ionization is happening. Um, the uh, but uh, okay, so the and so the so this is without any fine tuning, um, but using you know, uh, uh, AG and emissivity models and different uh, spectral indices for the ionizing background, and then these th this is there there has been a lot of argument as to whether we really understand how quasars evolve at, at high redshifts, so, and it's it's very hard to measure this faint into the luminosity function. And so this is just taking kind of simple parameterization for how extended helium ionization should be. And the, the, uh, the, 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 the data seems to favor less extended models over, over more extended. Yes. This is very dry. Oh, so here we're yeah, extrapolating to zero, and so it depends. The temperature density relationship is like is changing over helium ionization. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So look at our paper. I I just find them less intuitive to look at, but but our paper definitely has this. Okay, but it but this is this is because of temperature density relationship evolving. Okay. And then, uh, okay, so then the, and then the, I guess, th just to make a simple point that, like, things seem to, like, be working really well with these observations. And, th and so then this really constrains, like, how much other stuff you can put into the intergalactic medium, how much heating. Um, and uh, the, and, and, but I won't go into this, this talk. But, uh, but it doesn't, it's not, it, it, from the observations, uh, the most recent observations, it's not obvious that we need some other source of, of heat injection, and it se seems pretty successful. Uh, uh, here. Yeah, so, th so you're ionizing the universe, and this makes it so that the temperature density relationship is flattening. The, be, 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 um, and so th this is causing, so, th so this, or th you're, you're ionizing the helium, so helium two is becoming helium three, you're heating things up. And then the reason these are, th this is kind of where there's the most evolution in this relationship that we're needing to extrapolate. We're using our, this relationship to extrapolate the, the temperature of the mean. I agree with Michael that really, like it makes the most sense to compare in the observed space, but it's really kind of a not intuitive space. Yeah, so it should be really cold at redshift zero. But but it, so then it starts shocking. So the so the the statement is that redshift zero, about fifty percent of the mass in the universe is shock heated and is not on is not photoionized anymore. And it, um, the okay, so then that's a tr so th then the th it starts to shock heat at redshift one. Um, the um, the the shock heating is not included in this model. The it's it's not it's not important at redshift two and above. The by volume, ninety percent of the volume in the universe isn't shock heated even at redshift zero. But like, but by mass, most most of the mass is is shock heated. Okay. Application two is uh, the the uh, and, and I, I think this is kind of a neat result. The so so we don't have measurements of the temperature of the universe at redshift five to six, um, but there 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 might be the there might be evidence 
in 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 the Lyman Alpha force that that there are large temperature fluctuations. Okay, and so the, the here are um, seven large high redshift quasar site lines, um, and so this this is redshift five in in these spectra, and this is redshift six, um, and this is the Lyman Alpha forest, and you can see that the Lyman Alpha forest has humongous fluctuations from place to place. Um, and then the, um, the Mi Michael Strauss and others found uh, these. Th there are these Gunn Peterson troughs that start to appear, and and I'm not showing the highest redshift quasars, and th those the Gunn Peterson troughs are even more striking. Um, and so the, um, however, the for at least at these redshifts, if you then narrow zoom in on the Gunn Peterson trough, so this let's look at this Gunn Peterson trough. The, this is the Lyman beta region of that spectrum. So the same same gas is absorbing the, in Lyman alpha here, Lyman alpha beta here, and the the if so this is Lyman alpha complete absorption. Lyman beta there's a there's a fair amount of transmission, and so this is telling you that it's still pretty ionized. Uh, this this region in the universe, even though the 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 um, the, the Ly Lyman alpha is saturated. Um, but and so then the question is, what is driving these huge opacity fluctuations? We don't see those opacity fluctuations at lower redshifts. Um, it's hard th that part. That statement is hard to see from this plot because Lyman beta is kind of coming in over here, wh where you would what you would attribute to lower redshifts. But we the um, and, and so what 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 can source these large opacity fluctuations? So at our our the like hu huge success of the Lyman alpha forest models at low redshift is. That if you just assume a uniform ionizing background everywhere, then then the and and assume density fluctuations are driving the statistics of the fluctuations, this does fa fabulous things, and this was assumed in the temperature inferences that I showed you earlier. Um, but the at redshift five to six, and and this was claimed a while ago, but uh, um, uh, w uh, but the statistics have gotten uh, gotten better and better. The red redshift five to six, if you plot. Well, so what is plotted here is the opacity in 50 megaparsecs over H region uh, observed in the Lyman Alpha Forest. Um, and then the dash is, the, is a model that only includes density fluctuations. And so if I, if I did this at low redshifts, the two models w would be right on top of each other. But as I go up in redshifts, the, the, there starts to be more high opacity regions than a density fluctuation alone model can give. So more, more high opacity. And then by redshifts, I mean, it's 5.8. There's a, there's, there's a huge difference. And so this is telling us that there's some other source of fluctuation. In, in, and, and I argue that these are ionized regions. So, so the, and this, this really leaves you with two options. It could be fluctuations in the temperature of the intergalactic medium. You can, we're t looking at neutral hydrogen. And so neutral hydrogen um, in photoionization equilibrium is proportional to how quickly it can recombine, which is uh, proportional to temperature. Um, the the or um, the uh, temperature of minus 0 0.7 or 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 it could be because there are the UV background is fluctuating from place to place in the universe. Those are the only two things other than density that can that can give you large fluctuations in the Lyman alpha forest. Um, okay, so how would this work with temperature? So with temperature, as I told you, the universe ionizes to 20,000 Kelvin, and then then it the and then it cools. If and we're observing at redshift five to six, regions that are ionized at redshift six haven't cooled very much. Regions that are ionized above redshift nine have have um, cooled. We're here we're considering pretty under dense regions because those are the regions that you observe at these high redshifts. Um, the have cooled to to just a couple thousand Kelvin, and so there should be a huge range of temperatures that are that just driven by this. Ionization and cooling physics. And and again, temperature is temperature affects the amount of H one, and you're seeing H one in the Lyman alpha force. Okay, and so then, uh, uh, so what? How do we expect this to affect the statistics of the Lyman alpha forest? So the in order to do. To make a prediction for this, you have to do something that might sound really messy. So I have to model reionization, and so there, there's kind of a racket in this field, which is that the and Matthias maybe started this, which is that the the 
maybe I don't have to do radiative transfer, and maybe I just have to find, it, I know how galaxies cluster in the universe. And so if I, if I find over places where there are a lot of galaxies, those are the regions that should ionize earlier, and pla places that have less galaxies should ha ionize la later. And so there's a way of kind of formally writing that down in the context of excursion set models. Um, and then the, what people find, so then people spend a lot of energy and uh, CPU hours running radio transfer simulations, lar really lar and you need to do large scales to have a statistical sample of the, uni of the universe. Um, and, and they find that when they compare to these density, mo uh, these with the galaxy clustering models, they the galaxy clustering models do pretty well at describing the statistics of, of, of when things are ionized. Um, the, um, Okay, and so th what is plotted here is one of these galaxy clustering based models and the and the um, the different colored regions are, the red regions are regions that are ionized early and the blue are ionized later. And so you can see, and this is just a generic thing that uh, that, uh, that everyone finds, that there, there are, ten, there you, the expectation is there are really large regions that are ionized earlier and, and e maybe even larger regions that are ionized later. And so then, then I, I, I can say that these regions that are ionized later are going to be hotter and these colder. Uh, the earlier re regions ionized earlier are going to be colder. And so then I can, um, I can predict what the Lyman alpha force transmission should be. So this is a region that was ionized, uh, just taking a skewer through the simulation, a safety over H mega project skewer. And the, this, the most of this skewer was ionized maybe, you know, redshift 12 to 10. And, the, and there's no transmission because this region is really cold and so there's a lot of H1. Um, whereas if this is a region that ionized mostly a, around you know, redshift six to eight, and then there's a lot of transmission. So then you can um, you can go back to the statistic where we so this is the the dotted curve is the density fluctuation only model, um, the the histogram is the observation, and the um, and then the different curves are different reionization histories. That that's what we find this is most sensitive to. The, and if we make reionization history extended enough, then at least the breadth of this TDF, there, there are some points that we have, we can't explain some of the rarest regions in the universe, but the breadth of this TDF is really kind of nicely matched, like, and it's redshift evolution. The redshift evolution is like something that just naturally popped out. We have no freedom in how this should evolve with re because that's just determined by cooling physics. Uh, but but uh, th th this model where temperature fluctuations are driving the fluctuations we see, the, um, it, uh, the, uh, somehow matches the evolution of the width of this TDF. And it, if it is temperature fluctuations, then what we find found is that we needed about 50% of the universe to be ionized above redshift nine, and that reionization to end pretty late around redshift six. Yeah. Oh, these are ionization histories, I should have said. Um, so the, the blue is a pretty short reionization, so the effect is smaller. Um, yeah, that's all, all I can do, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So, th and this would be kind of neat. So let's say this is true, then, uh, and, I'll, and I'll briefly discuss the competing model. The, the, then th this tells us that the re these gun Peterson troughs are regions that are ionized earlier in the universe and they're just colder. And there are ways to test this. Um, the, um, the other possibility, as I mentioned, is that, it, okay, rather than temperature fluctuations in the universe, it could be that, so galaxies cluster, and so you, they, and if you have more galaxies, then you have more fo photons around those galaxies. Um, the, how am I doing on time? I saw someone look at the watch for I think we're, okay, cool. Um, so, so the, and so the, um, the, uh, and so the, uh, and, <coughs> uh, so, and so you can have enhancements in the ionizing background in certain regions versus other regions. Um, and so this, in a sense, this, you, you, it turns out you need larger fluctuations for this to work than for temperature because the, your sources are in overdense regions and you, and it's more natural to have transmission in your, in the void regions. And so the, 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 the you, it's working against the, the, the flow of things. Um, and so people, but people have looked at what it would require, like uh, in, in order to explain the, 
the, the, the Gunn Peterson cost. And, and what, what they find, so the, I said that the, you, so you have clustering of galaxies, but if I make the mean free path of ionizing photons really large, then, then and I'm a point in the IGM, then I see a lot of galaxies. So, and so the fluctuations are small. This is why fluctuations in the ionizing background are small at late times and in the Lyman alpha fourth. We can measure the mean free path, it's really long. Uh, but uh, if I make the mean free path shorter and shorter, then these fluctuations in the ionizing background will go up and up. And so you can quantify kind of what mean free paths you need. And you need sh fairly short, 10 co-moving megaparsec mean free paths. I read the 5.5. 5 5. Um, and the, it, it's with a really neat method. Th 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 we have a really neat method for measuring mean free path of ionizing photons that, um, the, um, that I won't go into. But we've measured it as high as ratio of 5.2. And that method is is, um, is is binding values that are are, are a factor of two to three too long. Um, the uh, and, and I can talk later about potential issues with this me method. But the um, but but it, it is possible that intensity fluctuations could also be the explanation. Um, and then or so either you need really short mean free paths, or you can take the these the longer mean free paths that are absorbed observed. And then you need quasar-like sources, um, which I argued that quasars in order uh, are, 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 are coming into abundance around redshift three to explain the temperature of, of helium-2 reionization. And so the, if, if helium-2 reionization is happening at redshift three and not much higher redshift, then it's, it's hard to say that, that, uh, that quasars are sourcing the ionizing background at redshift five and a half. Um, but there are some papers claiming that this is the, this is the, the resolution. Okay, and this is just a sum up. So I think both have implications for reionization. If it's temperature fluctuations, the reionization has to be extended. If it's intensity fluctuations, the mean free path is very short. And you can argue the, that, the, that it's prob probably reionization happened fairly recently. But it, uh, and I, it, I w I'm not gonna get into the details. Okay, and so final application, the just to touch base with the galaxy formation people is uh, the, so the IGM uh, temperature, so, so, so it, al it also affects the formation of dwarf galaxies. And so the, uh, the, in the Milky Way, we see these ultra faint dwarfs. There's been a huge amount of research on them in the last few years. Um, and so if you look at the stellar population, so this is a color magnitude diagram, the, the stellar populations are quite old. Um, and so the blue band is uh, isochrones uh, for 13.7 giga, giga years plus or minus one. And I, we, don't, we don't see a lot of stars, but it, look, it looks like there's a rollover around. Uh, so, so they're consistent with being the, the age of the universe for some of these um, the, um, galaxies. Um, And so the so so there are two hypotheses for what sets the minimum mass of galaxies, and I think uh, it, uh, one of the hypotheses is that it's internal feedback processes, so supernova or or, or wind from stars, um, and the other hypothesis is that it's set by the temperature of the intergalactic medium. And if if you ask a simulator who who like Volker Springle, they'll tell you that both of these are important. That uh, that um, that, that it, if they don't heat up the universe because of reionization in their simulations, and I should say that all simulations that everyone is doing is not heating up the IGM enough, that, that, that's an aside. But if they don't heat, heat up the, 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 the simulation from a reionization, then, then, then they don't, the, the properties of their ultra faint dwarfs are, are different. Um, and so the one nice thing about I, the being the IGM temperature is that so the the when you ionize the universe, then this the the genes mass of the intergalactic medium increases a lot, um, the, uh, because the IGM was really cold before it was photoionized, uh, and so this would predict that it, m it might predict that you have these ionization fronts that go across the universe, and then the it's your gal galaxy formation in small potential wells just freezes, and. And so the and this this could be an explanation for these these why most of many of these ultra faint dwarfs form most of their stars in, in you know the first couple billion years. Um, 
Yeah, the so that that would predict the, the, uh, in the first billion years. I I would argue from what I'll tell you in a second that it's not it shouldn't be as dramatic a shut off as that. Um, uh, but the the models it, and the, these models are applied to semi-analytic mo uh, galaxy formation models, for example. The um, the they're pretty simplistic for how the IGM affects the the masses of galaxies, and the uh, and so there are two competing models that people use. One is basically taking the genes mass of the universe at at, reg at the over density zero, or I put genes in quotations because this is often called the filtering mass, and saying this is the mass scale um, of that uh, ha that a, uh, a galaxy halo has to be above in order for the gas to accrete onto that galaxy. The other criteria is uh, um, advocated by this group is that rather than the um, over density of, uh, of zero, or uh, sorry, uh, yeah, over density, Sorry, this would be over density. So th I, I should have written one for my delta is one plus over density. Um, but rather than the um, del delta of, of one, um, uh, d delta of 200, the, 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 the um, over density of halos. Um, and so, the, and so they, they take the genes formula essentially and, s and, s and stick in over density 200. And they claim that this works better. And so the, th this is one of my final plots. Um, but th I think there's kind of a there's the, the, there's a fun fun plot you can make that illustrates kind of the physics that that is at play in, in shaping the the minimum mass of galaxies from this gene suppression. And so the, this is the temperature of the inter of, of of the gas, and this is the density. And th then on this plot, I can plot the genes mass. Um, um, the, so these are cont contours of constant genes mass. I can plot adiabats. I can plot the 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 um, the temperature and density where where c collisional cooling becomes important for for various values of the ionizing background, as observed at um, this is the ionizing background level observed between reds of zero and two, and this is roughly between two and five. Um, the and, and also that at reds of six, the ionizing background is kind of like this, uh, is kind of this level. So, so th this is where the, the gas is able to cool within a dynamical time via collision. And so now we can, c we can plot trajectories of, of collapsing um, um, particles. So, um, so, and so let, me, let me kind of give you a sense for how this works. So, the, whoops. so okay, so let's say I'm a gas parcel that, uh, that collapses at redshift six onto halo. This is all in spherical collapse, and then I'm gonna show you simulations. Um, and so if I, uh, if, I'm a, a re, uh, uh, if I collapse into a halo at redshift six, then it turns out that I was at, uh, and I'm gonna assume that reionization happened at redshift 10, and it also turns out if you collapse at redshift six, turnaround, so wh when your density starts increasing, also happens at redshift 10. And so what happens is I'm heated by reionization to 20,000 Kelvin. Um, and, uh, but I'm also at turnaround, and, the, and so then I just cool the, um, and, 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 uh, and collapse to higher densities it, uh, along, this, uh, along, uh, um, along this curve where, um, co collisional, uh, where collisional cooling is the dynamical time. Um, and I'm able to do this as long as I'm greater than the genes mass at, um, along my entire trajectory. And so if I'm, my mass is greater than 10, the 10 solar masses, then I'm able to follow this curve. If it's not, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm not, I'm gonna stop. But yeah, uh, this is just, this is primordial. So this is first, first galaxy. This is the mean density of the universe, by the way. And so the, the where, where a lot of the p formula people are using are, are evaluating the genes mass. Okay, so now let's say I'm a, a shell that collapses at redshift three and reionization was at, at uh, redshift 10, so I, reionization heats me to 20,000 Kelvin, then I cool with the expansion of the universe, so photoheating is kind of important as well. And then, then I heat up somewhat adiabatically, and then I reach a, a density where I can cool, and then I, and, and as long as I'm above the, the, the genes mass at all points along my trajectory, then I'm able to cool and, and form a galaxy. Yeah, so you should think of the, the, this genes mass as kind of the, the, the potential well that I'm collapsing into. Is it enough to cool me in? Yeah, with the dark matter. That's what I thought that you were going to say. 
Yeah, so the, the, there's a, that, that's a counter thing. Yeah. And then if, if I were at redshift zero, my trajectory might look like something like this. And so I'm, I'm, not I'm just gonna briefly summarize what, this, what we did in this paper. So that was our theory, and then we went into simulations. So in simulations, gas doesn't collapse spherically, but, uh, but, but more or less, like kind of this is the picture that we, we tracked the halo mass that a gas particle was following into, um, and, and, um, the, and the maximum genes mass along this trajectory. And we, f we found that this, this, this criteria seemed to kind of roughly explain the, the, the fraction of baryons that a halo of a given mass could, 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 could hold on to. Um, and so if you're interested, the, I don't have the citation on this, on, on, that, uh, on that slide, but uh, please look at this paper. Um, and so, okay, so conclusion are that the, these temperature measurements post-2010 seem kind of in agreement with a minimal model for how the, th the thermal history of the universe should evolve. At redshift 5.5, we see these huge fluctuations in the opacity of the IGM. And uh, I think, th 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 so they either owe to temperature fluctuations or, or intensity fluctuations. And temperature fluctuations, the model kind of works fairly nicely. Um, and then, then I, I gave a picture for how the thermal history affects galaxy formation. That, and I didn't really go into it, but was w that was that we tried to validate in using cosmological simulations. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Although I would say that like one really surprising thing about the intergalactic medium is that though we can't do this in low density regions, but when you do this at like moderate over density regions, if you stack a bunch of um, the um, uh, uh, absorbers in the Lyman Alpha forest, you always you almost always see metals, and the uh, and so the and so people have been able to make statements about the filling fraction of metals. But it's for moderately over dense regions, the, like somehow metals are getting out there, which is kind of amazing. Yeah. 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 So the so the so for in order so there are two things that could happen with cosmic rays. So so one is that you you you're you're producing cosmic rays that have an energy that's kind of tuned, and I think it's like to, I think this might be like to, to tens of MeV, so that they they can coolum like collisionally cool like within the Hubble time. Um, the um, uh, uh, and and so the for I think it is the case for GeV cosmic rays they will just never uh, coulomb scatter and um, uh, uh, sufficiently to lose their energy. Um, the they have to lose they have to lose some yeah. Um, then, then the other possibility is that there, so there are these streaming instabilities for cosmic rays, where they then they excite Alfane waves, and uh, and and this could be, a, and then this co this generates magnetic field, and this could couple them to the gas, and this could be another source of pressure. Um, so the the if you're increasing the pressure of the intergalactic medium and not the temperature, then then. The, the observations are less sensitive to that because they're more sensitive to the thermal broadening than they are the, pres the pressure of the, um, of the absorbers. Um, um, but, and then for these, these streaming instabilities, you're usually in like an MHD limit where the, uh, you need some like seed magnetic field. And, and so there, I think the, the, the answer is that these haven't been considered to the detail that I would like for the, for the intergalactic medium. People have kind of postulated that these things could be occurring. For the for the Coulomb losses, it 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 the my my impression from looking at this literature is that it's pretty difficult to to heat up the the IGM um, significantly, um, but I think this this does is, is something that needs to be revisited.
I'm glad you brought that up because the oh yeah, so there was this claim of these enormous variations in spectral index, and the so I I looked into this um, and gave a talk here at the IES a couple years ago, um, where and so what they were doing is they were measuring the the um, number density in helium two, the number density in H in H one, because you have the helium two and H one Lyman optical cores for a few quasons. And they found that this fluctuated hugely, like on, on megaparsec scales. And you can show that this is telling you about the ratio of the photoionization rates that are keeping these species ionized. Um, so I did a measurement of this, like uh, on the site, site lines, the two are be two best helium two site lines. And the helium two lines, of course, there are two site lines that are so much more, so, so much higher signal to noise than all of the others. Um, and the, my, my result was that the, there's no evidence for fluctuations less than at the factor two level and not on the, sm on the small scales that had been claimed. And, that it and, and I think what the problem was the how the analysis was being done because the helium two is so saturated. You have 100 times more helium two in the universe than hydrogen at these redshifts. And so the, the, the when, when you have really saturated absorber then um, the, and you're trying to take ratios of optical depth then it's hard to measure optical depth. And so they, I think the fluctuations were from how they were trying to do this. And so I don't think these fluctuations are the 